Hey guys, Hop here. This is a Ruger SFAR, although you may not have recognized it right away because it's no longer in its factory configuration. This is actually my second sample of the SFAR. I reviewed this rifle for TFB TV. I'll put a link to that video in the uh, corner if you want to go watch that one. The short version is that I really liked the rifle, but my first sample of it had some pretty troublesome reliability issues. So, sent it back in to Ruger. They replaced it with one that's working a lot better. This is one that I'm going to do a follow-up review on. Part of that process, though, is seeing how much of this rifle you can actually customize. In its factory configuration, the SFAR really only makes sense to me as a lightweight hunting rifle or a throwback battle rifle. A lot of that comes down to Ruger's choice of handguard on the 16-inch model. As you can see, this is no longer the original handguard. That is one of the components that you can swap out on this gun. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. What can you actually replace or upgrade on an SFAR and what makes sense to replace or upgrade? Because just because you can change something probably doesn't mean you should. Let's go for it. So the main thing that I didn't like about the SFAR was Ruger's choice of factory handguard on the 16-inch model. The 16-inch model has a 15-inch free float rail with an interrupted top Picatinny section, and it's also got some very aggressive skeletonizing cuts, and it also has some little cutouts for access to the gas regulator, so you can get the gas adjustment key in there. The 20-inch version has a 15-inch rail with a full length of Picatinny on the top, kind of strange, and that one doesn't have the access cuts for the gas regulator. That difference is because the 15-inch rail on a 20-inch barrel with a rifle length gas system, you can actually just poke the gas adjustment key down the front of the handguard to adjust it. You don't have to access from the side if it's shrouded like on the 16-inch model. Now, that doesn't really mean that they couldn't have just added a full length of Picatinny top rail to the 16-inch model. It would actually have made a lot more sense but I think they probably just did that because they could reuse uh, an existing rail design very easily for the 20 inch model and not so easily for the 16 inch model. Whatever, the only advantage I can think of to the interrupted top rail is that it might allow you to clear a much larger scope bell. Okay, but then why is the interrupted top rail on the 16 inch? Is the 16 inch rifle the one that you're gonna put a massive 56 millimeter objective scope on or is the 20 inch more likely to have that type of scope? Right, so that's kind of a little peculiar. Um, the 16 inch one then ends up being kind of limited in application. You can use it as, you know, a hunting rifle, obviously. Maybe you could use it as like a heavier version of an SPR. Uh, accuracy of the SFAR has not been like amazing across the board. I think it's perfectly acceptable for what the rifle is designed for, but if you're really going for precision, probably not the rifle you're going to want to buy. One of the things that's appealing about the SFAR is that it's so light that it makes the battle rifle concept kind of interesting again because you are no longer being overly weighed down by the weight of the rifle and it's one of the few 308 rifles that you can actually attach a complement of modern accessories to without turning it into an absolutely obese pig. You're still going to be rounds limited because the ammunition is much heavier and much larger being fired out of much larger magazines, but you may decide that that trade-off and capability is worth it to you. But there's just not a lot of stuff you can do with an interrupted top rail. You can mount a weapon light uh, with an offset mount and just activate it, you know, with your thumb or whatever. But tape switches is going to be a problem. Lights uh, and lasers and stuff are going to be a lot more limited in placement. You wouldn't be able to use it with, for example, a rail attached thermal or night vision clip on if that was the sort of thing that you were interested in. I know it's a very small category of people who are only willing to spend $1,000 on a lightweight battle rifle, but they also want to attach night vision laser accessories to it. And yeah, I guess that's true, but that's the weird little niche of people that I guess you and I happen to fall into, right? So, that's the thing that I've replaced. As you can see, this is no longer the original handguard that the gun came with. These are compatible with standard AR-15 handguards. A lot of the aftermarket parts for the SFAR are actually AR-15 compatible, not AR-10 or DPMS LR-308 compatible, like with most 308 ARs. In a lot of ways, that's better. The AR-15 aftermarket is a lot more standardized than the AR-10 or LR-308 aftermarket. For example, uh, there are multiple different rail heights of DPMS LR-308 handguards. AR-15, it's only one type. And almost all AR-15 handguards should work on the SFAR, provided that they have enough space on the inside to clear the gas regulator. The gas regulator is very similar in size to a gas block, a low profile gas block that you'd see on an AR-15, except the adjustment at the top is a little bit beefier. So a handguard with a very large internal uh, diameter 
uh, relative to its overall size is probably going to work okay. There are a lot of handguards that have more material on the inside of the top rail, and those are not going to clear the gas regulator. This is a Midwest Industries combat rail. It is just a free float M-lock rail. It's 12.625 uh, inches. I chose that length very, very specifically. We'll talk about that in a second. But this rail works no problem with the SFAR. So any Midwest combat rail should be a, an aftermarket replacement if you want it. The gas block is not pinned in place or anything. It is held in with two set screws and uh, there are some really tiny little barrel dimples. So it's actually pretty easy to line it back up. Not the most you know, robust thing in the world, but it's fine. It's, it's well protected. So it's actually very easy to disassemble this thing. You can take the gas regulator off the same way you would remove a low profile gas block from any AR. You can remove the factory barrel nut with just a large crescent wrench. And then you can install you know, a lot of different handguards in place of the factory one. Interestingly, this handguard is actually lighter than the factory handguard. So I have added a full length of top uh, Picatinny rail to this rifle and reduced the overall weight. Part of that is because this is a 13, approximately 13 inch rail instead of a 15 inch rail. Part of it is also that the Ruger barrel nut is quite beefy. It's possible that having a smaller barrel nut like the one on the Midwest Industries handguards will become a problem over time. We're going to find out. I'm going to try to shoot this thing as much as I can in this configuration to see if I've created any sort of a weird uh, reliability problem. So far it's been working great and I don't think it's actually going to be an issue. The reason I chose a 12.625 inch rail is because this rail does not have any access for the gas regulator key, which is stored in the pistol grip. You could just get a longer key uh, if you wanted to still be able to adjust the gas while reaching down the end from a much longer handguard, but this I find quite a lot easier. This is just enough clearance that I can still use the key that comes in it to adjust the gas regulator, although it is a little harder to tell what position you're on because you can't really see the numbers very well. I guess you could always just drill your own little access hole so you could see the numbers. Depending on the handguard that you use, you may have an issue where the ejection port door axle is no longer properly retained by the handguard, and so it could actually slide forward and pop itself out. That does seem to be the case with a Midwest handguard. It's just barely not coming back far enough to keep the axle uh, port door in, so it would slide out, pop itself out. So I have attached a Magpul uh, dust cover because this one just holds itself in place with springs. It doesn't need to be retained by anything. Uh, also, they look cool, in my opinion. Also, they're really easy to install. And also, they're cheap. God, I love Magpul. You could also, in theory, replace the gas regulator with a gas block of your own choosing. This is actually a .750 gas journal, which is the AR-15 standard size. And it's also uh, a size that's used on some, like, pencil weight or Hanson-style uh, ballistic advantage LR-308, you know, 308 AR-10-style barrels. Uh, I don't think that's a very good idea because... I have no idea if you're going to even have the required level of gas adjustment to make this thing run reliably and safely with any sort of aftermarket gas block, particularly because it's probably going to be designed for a different platform. Also, the gas regulator is one of the most appealing things about this. It's a simple, rugged, four-position gas regulator. It doesn't have finicky set screws or anything like that, or tiny little itty-bitty grub screws. It doesn't have any you know, components that are so small they might seize up with carbon. You got four positions off suppressed, regular, adverse, very nice, very clean, much more interesting and usable, particularly if we're talking, you know, battle rifle, rifle to be shot in the field. You're not like obsessed with tuning the recoil down to just the tiniest little bit of the impulse and you're perfectly tuning your ejection pattern to 345, the time of day when you most like to have tea. No, you just have one big course adjustment to uh, go from regular shooting to suppressed shooting. The barrel threads are one of the only places where this is actually more like a 308 than it is like an AR-15. The muzzle is threaded standard 5 8 by 24. Same thing for almost any 30 cal rifle. So this thing has a YHM Phantom Mini QD adapter on there to be used with a quick attach suppressor. I also had tried uh, just direct threading a suppressor on there. Uh, which worked perfectly fine, but this is kind of a little more compelling to me because you can keep the gun nice and lightweight and then attach a suppressor as needed. And because you've got a very easy to adjust gas regulator system, you're not like worried about trying to tune it for one uh, mode of operation or another. The downside is that this is a flash hider, not a brake. This is an extremely lightweight rifle chambered in 308. And when you replace the factory boomer brake, which is a big fuck off hunk of metal, multi multiple uh, big braking ports, place that with a flash hider, this thing no longer shoots very good. It's a little bit excessive. But with the suppressor back on it, it's fine. And also, I could have just used a, uh, a YHM 30 cal brake mount instead. Except I lost it. I don't know where it went. So all I have is flash hiders right now. 
Almost all the other parts are AR-15 compatible. That's not very weird on lowers. I know LR-308s also use basically just the same lower parts as an AR-15. So uh, if you wanted to change or upgrade the safety, that would just be a regular AR-15 part. Same thing with the pistol grip. Same thing with the trigger, although none of that stuff really makes too much sense. I mean, no, people are picky about grips, but uh, the trigger that comes on here is already really, really good. It's the Ruger Elite 2 stage, so I don't think you should replace that. I don't know, some trigger snobs still don't seem to like it. Uh, as far as the end plate and castle nut goes, this is a plastic end plate. It does have a sling QD uh, cup in there if you're the kind of person who likes running your, your uh, sling on the back of the, of the receiver end plate. Um, you could, in theory, replace this, like dimensionally it will work. However, because the receiver is much shorter overall than a LR308 receiver would be, the fire control grip and everything has been moved back, and you can see the overlap of the pistol grip on the uh, end plate and castle nut. Uh, if you replace this with a regular end plate, then you'd have a whole weird unsightly gap. Um, and the thing is that this pistol grip, it's not just that the beaver tail is covering this up, it's actually the entire pistol grip. So if we put a regular AR pistol grip on there, we'd have a weird shelf pretty much regardless. So might as well just keep this all in place. Um, I know you, some people are probably going to be like, well, I don't know, man, you can't stake the plastic into the castle nut. Yeah, just, you know, it's a PMCS thing, right? So just repeatedly check it to make sure it's tight before you go off gallivanting around in the field to uh, shoot animals or LARP or something like that. Uh, the buffer system, this is using a 308 spring. It's very, very stiff, much stiffer than a regular AR-15 spring, but it uses an AR-15 carbine buffer. This is a regular three ounce AR-15 length buffer, not the reduced length that you would see on uh, LR-308 pattern rifles. And that's because this bolt carrier group is still AR-15 sized. So it doesn't uh, take up as much space in the buffer tube as an LR-308 would. You could, of course, replace the stock with anything typical as well. You can also replace the charging handle. This is a Radiant Raptor charging handle. It's ambidextrous. Uh, if you wanted to, for example, run this thing aggressively suppressed, you could use a gas-busting charging handle in there. But the big question that a lot of guys have had is, can I replace the barrel? Uh, for probably a couple of reasons. One, this is actually a heavy profile barrel. Ruger amazingly did not cheat the weight by putting a pencil barrel in this thing. It's extremely lightweight and it has a very nice thick barrel. But if you really are obsessed with reducing the weight of this platform as much as possible, you might be thinking, well, hey, can I put a regular, you know, uh, taper profile barrel in there or a pencil barrel, something like that? The answer I'm going to give is don't try it. Ruger makes a lot of uh, press about the super alloy that they're using in the bolt head and the barrel extension to make this thing actually safe to shoot. Also, the barrel extension has these pressure relief holes drilled into it at multiple points around the perimeter that line up with pressure relief holes in the upper receiver forging itself that seems to be a, a safety blow-off system so you do kind of have to wonder there have been a lot of attempts to put larger cartridges in an AR-15 size size bolt head in the past for example 6.5 Grendel uh, or 6.8 SBC or 760 by 39 in an AR uh, historically those had issues with bolt cracking because you're basically just taking a ton of material out of the bolt head so you can fit a larger uh, cartridge base in there. That's the same thing that Ruger did with this. The bolt head and uh, bolt geometry is still the size of an AR-15 bolt more or less but it's been sized to fit a 308. So that weakens the bolt head. And also, since there's less material, I believe, in the, in the barrel extension, the barrel extension could have been weakened by, you know, re reduction of material. Ultimately, I would say that trying to replace the barrel and bolt carrier group on this rifle would be not worth it. I doubt it would work, but it wouldn't be safe anyway, so just don't try it. <laughs> That's not like a cover your ass answer either. No, I'm actually saying don't try it. So there you go. The main deficiency of the Ruger SFAR, particularly the 16-inch version, is just that rail that it comes with, and that is very easy to replace, and I doubt it will cause you any major problems. I've seen uh, pictures of people replacing them with Geisley rails, which might seem like kind of a strange idea to put a heavy rail on a lightweight rifle, but you could also think about it the other way. You start with such a lightweight package that adding some weight to the rail, not really the end of the world, because the overall weight is still quite low, and you get a nice rigid rail that you can use for whatever accessories you want on there. Even just swapping it out for a Midwest Industries combat rail, which is a very uh, lightweight rail design, having that top rail is quite a lot better. As you can see, we can put a tape switch on here if we wanted to. We can put a laser module on here if we wanted to. Uh, it's also just, in general, a nicer rail. Uh, those Ruger MPR style handguards are not that great. They got these big old holes in them and your fingers can get like stuck in there and you can touch a hot barrel. It's just kind of, it's kind of lame. So this looks way better, 
feels a lot better. And it's actually slightly lighter because we knocked a couple inches off the rail and added us a, uh, a top rail instead. Anyway, let me know if you guys have any questions. Uh, thanks for watching. If you'd like to support this channel, you can do so via subscribe star, link usually in the video description or uh, in the link tree in the video description. If you join subscribe star, you'll also get to watch early videos, some bonus videos, as well as the archived live show that I do periodically with Mr. Brassfax. So thank you guys very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Oh, ammo. Ah, oh well. I guess I wasn't meant to be happy.